This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is the Abi era over. And our guest is uh, retired U.S. Navy Captain Carl Schuster. Uh, Captain Schuster uh, these days is a faculty member at Hawaii Pacific University. Uh, he also is a defense contractor, and we're really glad to have him with us. Welcome to Asian Review. Thank you, sir. Thanks for inviting me. You're quite welcome. It's great to have you here. Well, get right to it. Is the Abi era of prime ministership coming to an end? Not right away. Uh, nothing really moves quickly in Japan. I mean, he's had some reverses. Economy's not doing as well as he promised. His defense minister had to resign. Probably economics really hasn't panned out. Has Indeed. It? Yeah. Uh, there's been some improvement, but not as much as promised. Uh, also, uh, the Japanese people are very, uh, or increasingly wary of uh, defense initiatives. Uh, on occasion, the North Koreans do something that generates support for it. But in general, they worry about how far to go. And his defense minister had to resign because she understated the threat Japanese peacekeepers faced in South Sudan. And that's a worry in Japan. Mm. Their military is all volunteer, but their military is also older. Mm. Uh, typical Japanese soldiers in his late 20s, early 30s, whereas most military, majority of the soldiers are in their early 20s. Mm. And you'll see the same thing in their Navy. So they're very casualty sensitive and they're very risk sensitive. And they are also uh, very uh, sensitive to how they're portrayed internationally. For them, peacekeepers are there to keep the peace. They're really not comfortable going into a place where there's no peace to keep. Mm. And uh, it raises up questions of will they go into combat? And if so, how will that play out? Uh, from purposes of their reputation and that, for that, their That's a good observation. Truth. I remember in the past when uh, Japan's been involved in peacekeeping um, exercises or activities or whatever we should call them, they've always had to have other countries provide cover for them. And some have not, uh, some of the countries providing cover haven't always been the uh, countries with the greatest military history, like the Dutch. Well, I probably shouldn't say that, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, also, Abe is facing some allegations of scandal, as I yes, understand sir. it. Uh, and at the moment, there isn't a lot of substance to them, but there's an awful lot of smoke. Mm. Uh, and in Japan, unlike the United States, politicians suffer consequences for even perceived dishonesty. Mm. Uh, there was a candidate many years ago who argued if he became prime minister, he'd get us out of Okinawa. And then he became uh, prime minister and suddenly saw the advantages to having us in Okinawa. He had to resign. Mm. Uh, and so for them, when they make a promise, they absolutely have to keep it. And the allegations are of influence peddling and some differences between what he said he would do and what he would do in respect to governance and uh, ending, shall we say, bad practices. And so uh, the credibility hit if it actually registers, could bring about his resignation. Hey, oh, it's really interesting. I, as I sit here listening to your comments, I think, well, that's good. You know, the, uh, the populist electorate is holding the prime minister to, you know, making them accountable. Yet, on the other hand, as I look around Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, I think the electorates there in some ways are so spoiled mm -hmm. that they, uh, one little thing happens and boom, their support evaporates. That's certainly true in Taiwan and South Korea, but that's not necessarily the case in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, they make those sorts of shifts rather cautiously, uh, but once they decide to move, then it's very fast. But they're very much a consensus culture. I know that's not the stereotype, but it truly is. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. So. And, and when I was stationed in Okinawa, Japanese paid for everything, and when I needed a modification made to meet the new security standards imposed after the Walker spy ring, uh, Japanese paid for everything, so I had to negotiate with them. And for me, it was very frustrating, because in America, we make the decision very quickly. It was about six weeks of negotiations, and I thought, this is never going to reach fruition. But once they agreed to the plan, it was over with in six weeks. They executed. Up, done, perfect, met every standard quality of the workmanship ship was unequaled. 
So you go through the consensus building process and the planning process, typical American, of which I am, you're going to get very frustrated. But once they decide to go, it's fast. And it's going to work out the same way for Abe. The building of a consensus to get rid of him is going to proceed slowly. His actions will determine whether he can defend it. Mm. Um, but if there's any truth to allegations of any kind of dishonesty or play for pay, he's gone. Um, interesting. Um, I, I know what you mean. Sometimes for Americans, dealing with Asians in a negotiating situation, be it in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China, can be very frustrating because, as you're saying, Americans want something now. They really don't want to go through this long, tedious, drawn-out process, which just sends them up the wall. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, um, you know, now when I think back about Abe's tenure in office, I remember the first time he was in office, it was pretty much a disaster. And, and, and you know, legitimately speaking, uh, in his defense, he had some health issues. And so he was no sooner there than gone. Um, but it does seem to me that he has provided stability for Japan. That, you know, it was for a certain period of time. Who's, the question of the day was, who's the Japanese prime minister today? And you just sort of began to learn his name and began to feel a little comfortable with him, and boom, they're gone. This, you know, revolving door. So Abe has provided leadership. He has provided stability. I mean, he has been controversial when it comes to security issues, but uh, I think, it, you know, pretty much it's been to America's liking, the security positions he's taken. Uh, it seems to me he's also been pretty supportive on Okinawa, and that's, as you yes, just said a minute ago, that's a constant thorn sir. in, um, um, in, in, in U.S.-Japanese <laughs> re relations. Yeah. Um, well, you know, he's done something that he often doesn't get credit for. He has expanded Japan's defense cooperation links. Prior to Prime Minister Abe, you didn't see India willing to do a defense cooperation agreement with Japan. He's even he's sending Japanese naval vessels on patrols into the South China Sea. That's correct, with the Philippines' blessing. Right. I mean, when you think about it, that is a major step. No previous prime minister could get the Philippines to to agree to do any kind of defense cooperation right. with Japan anywhere. Right. And India was reluctant to work with the Japanese as well. But are they and, certainly doing it now? Yeah, and they're, exactly. And that's all because of his, well, two things, China's aggressiveness mm -hmm. and his willingness to accommodate their side of the equation. He's done it in a very patient, what we would consider Japanese way. He didn't just send people and say, let's sign an agreement. He offered small steps to demonstrate the value and that he was open to it. His own, his own uh, brand of salami slicing. Exactly. And it's worked out for Japan. Japan has defense cooperative neighbors now, including Vietnam, which it didn't have just 10 years ago. Australia, the, the yep, relationship is fairly strong. Indeed. And, and they keep trying to improve or get a closer defense relationship with South Korea, and then that's always chancy. Um, yeah, it, it really seems to me that Prime Minister Abe, he, to me, he seems to be pretty much of a realist. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, Abe, he's just a war hawk. Look at his relatives. They're all wrapped up in World War II. They were war criminals and all that. And he's just, you know, a, a chip off the old block. But I think he's a realist because I think uh, and, in the sense that, you know, he, there's some fear in Japan as there is in every country in Asia. You know, one day the U.S. might just pack it up and leave. And what, what are we going to do? We're going to be left out the hang. And so we've got to be prepared for any eventuality. And I don't really think that's going to happen, but that's certainly a fear of every Asian government. Indeed. In fact, that's the one region of the world where there was very little reluctance to interact with us. Even the Vietnamese, after the war, were looking for ways to work with us. Uh, I went to their embassy in uh, Belgium many years Vietnamese, ago. Vietnamese uh, embassy. Uh, embassy. And it was interesting to go there. They didn't want to necessarily talk to me. They were friendly, but everyone with a Vietnam campaign ribbon they wanted to talk to. They wanted to see if they fought in the same place, exchange stories. And you have one of those. No, I didn't serve in Vietnam. I've got one. Oh, okay. okay. Well, you would have been welcome. Just yeah. The minute they saw a Vietnam campaign ribbon, they would eyeball that guy and go to him. And it was a great conversation. And once, it was interesting going, and the food they served were South Vietnamese dishes while we were there. But once they've understood we had no resentment, 
then you saw North Vietnamese dishes as well. So they went to a lot of trouble not to offend us, but it was clear they wanted to interact with us. And this is in the early 90s before we sent a ship in there. So the animosity that some of us feel towards them is not reciprocated. Quite the contrary. Although if you go to their war museum, they talk about atrocities and yeah, things of that I, nature. Yeah, I've been to those. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, you know, last year in Taiwan, I had a really a, a unique experience. Uh, one of my fellow, uh, fellow fellows, fellow grantees was from uh, Vietnam, and he obviously was a party official of some stature, actually. And just kind of sitting there and talking to him, you know, and they're very friendly, and he really tried to be friends after, you know, uh, I, I'm certain he was on the other side of the war, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, it was really quite a moving experience. Yeah, so I, I can I can relate to what you're saying. Well, um, okay, um, South Korea, Japan, always the issue comes up, comfort women. And there's always a stigma about Japanese colonialism, 45 years of Japanese colonialism. And there's always, I think, a feeling of the Koreans that feel somewhat of an inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis Japan. Um, I, I don't know, where's it going to go? I, I thought when... Um, two presidents ago, um, I thought he had a fairly intelligent approach to Japan, but then he sort of blew it at the end when, when over a territorial issue, or the islands in the, between mm -hmm. Japan and uh, South Korea. And then uh, when President Park was in office, uh, who's now in jail, <laughs> um, I don't know, she didn't do very well with it. She, she had troubles all along. Uh, yeah, I think the problem she had uh, is twofold. Mm. Her father served in the Japanese Army in World War II. I agree. I think she carried a lot of baggage because of her father. He and restored she, relations with Japan kind of early in many people's estimation. And she was trying to distance herself from that. And so I think she recognized the need for South Korea and Japan to cooperate together, uh, particularly in defense. But when Abe made the family connection, I don't think he realized that that was a connection she didn't want made and politically couldn't afford. Mm. And so the minute that came up, she had to instantly be more patriotic than anyone before her mm. so that people would forget her father was a company commander in the Japanese Army. Right. So uh, there's a two sides to that, and, it, and it's a lesson learned. We made the same mistake in some cases with Lebanon. One of the locals that we associated with was a man named Nobby Berry, a wonderful human being, but he had a green card. And so we went in and we emphasized the fact that he had lived in the U.S. and so forth. And what we didn't understand is to the Lebanese in Beirut, being associated with us was not a good thing. So we undermined his ability to cooperate with us every time we made that connection. And we didn't realize it until it was too late. You know, I, I, I sit here and think there are so many leaders of other countries who, who have gotten U.S. green cards, but then all of a sudden they decide to return to the motherland and they just totally want to suppress that. Ma Ying Zhou, um, mm -hmm. former president of Taiwan, he clearly had a U.S. green card. Uh, he used to be known as Mark, you know, but mm -hmm. he totally suppressed all that uh, at, when he started to run for president. Well, we've got about a, one minute here until break, and... Um, you know, one thing about the Abe administration that, that's interesting to me, especially since I focus a lot on Taiwan, is this is an administration that has, um, I think, really valued Japan's relationship with Taiwan, maybe more than other prime ministers. Japan always has a fairly close relationship with Japan, uh, with Taiwan, I, I mean, given mm -hmm. the, the, the political stage in which they perform on. Um, and there was even talk on his era of, um, you know, a sort of a... Um, Taiwan Relations Act, t Japan style. And there's always some chatter about, oh, the Japanese are going to sell decommissioned submarines to Taiwan. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but just in the 30 seconds or so we have before break, what's your take on that? Uh, I think that Japan will look for ways to help them develop their own submarines. Uh, something that's not big publicity, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, but can get it, get it done. Uh, China, Japan, and Taiwan have something of a special relationship. Mm -hmm. The Taiwans have a much kinder and uh, uh, optimistic view of the Japanese than those who came over from the mainland. Mm, right. And so uh, politically, with the Taiwans being more politically assertive, 
uh, you'll find more goodwill towards Japan among the majority of Taiwanese population than you will among many of their political elites. And Abe's been able to kind of wedge in there, uh, but you won't see any big ticket items. It'll be mostly small stuff, maybe Taiwanese engineers going to Japanese shipyards, maybe some small equipment, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But that's my speculation. I haven't seen any evidence. No, that's really interesting. Well, with that, I think we're uh, going to move on to the break. Uh, where you're watching Asian Review, I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is uh, Captain Carl Schuster, U.S. Navy retired, a former intelligence officer, a uh, faculty member at uh, Hawaii Pacific University these days, and also a defense contractor. Don't go away. When we come back, we're going to talk about Korea. We're going to straighten everything out on the Korean Peninsula. It, the solution might have evaded others, but we're going to nail it right here, so don't go away. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha! I'm going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr., uh, I should say Captain, Naval Captain, I'm going to make that clear, uh, Naval Captain uh, Carl Schuster. Uh, he is a retired Navy intelligence officer these days as a faculty member at Hawaii Pacific University and also a defense contractor. And we're having a really great discussion uh, during the first half about Japan. Um, and we talked about um, Prime Minister Abe. Is his time in office at the end? Is the Abe era coming to an end? Well, maybe not quite yet, but maybe, maybe fairly soon, but not quite yet. We want to move on to Korea, and uh, we're going to solve all the problems on the Korean Peninsula in, in one swoop. You know, the, the solution might have dated several U.S. administrations. And, and, and certainly the problem bedevils uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, the President of South Korea, but we're going to solve it right here. Okay, well, my solution, okay, recognize North Korea, sit down and talk with them, okay, accept it as a country with nuclear arms. Just because they have nuclear arms doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be shooting them all over the place. What are their intentions? And you know, on the other hand, I'm not so sure the South Koreans really want unification with North Korea because it costs too much money. And these two Koreas have gone their own separate ways. And historically, they've been very divided along similar lines that they're divided today. Sure. So this thing about the mother country, one has to look beyond the rhetoric of that. So what do you think? Well, I'm with you in terms of the uh, mother country. Uh, Korea has spent nearly as much time divided into three kingdoms as it has been uh, as a united uh, empire, if you will. If you will. Um, the other issue is you're absolutely right about the cost. When I was working with the South Koreans in the 1990s, one of the things that kept coming up was how much did it cost West Germany to absorb East Germany? Everybody always looks at that, don't they? Was the cost of Germany put out a lot of money, West Germany. It took almost 25% of West Germany's GDP to bring the East Germans up to within a decade of West Germany. Infrastructure was so out of tune with the times. Uh, 
And I mean, even the most minor stuff, even their telephones were 1950s technology. So the West Germans had to completely rebuild the infrastructure, the buildings, mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, 60% of West Germany's or Germany's national debt today uh, is from that unification cost, and it's not complete. You know, let me just interject a, uh, an experience. You know, I remember uh, in the old days when there was a Berlin Wall uh, going from West Berlin to East Berlin, and West Berlin was modern, you know, clean, sparkling, new, modern. East Berlin was broken, dirty, run down. And you know, communist countries are like that, aren't they? I yes, mean, sir. you know, I, I've been in enough communist countries to know that they, stuff doesn't work. It's all broken. It's, it's in need of repair. Well, much of that is because to a communist regime, the big image is more important than sustaining things. Mm. So they will build lots of stuff, but there's no glory in maintenance. And you'll find that a lot in anything this government run because you don't get promoted for maintaining something. You get promoted for building something new or creating something new. And so, and you'll see the same thing in some of our budgetary items. I'll well, throw you a curveball here, retired naval intelligence mm -hmm. officer. Um, what's the um, maintenance of Chinese naval vessels? Their maintenance is um, better than what the Soviet Union used to do, but nowhere near what the Japanese do and slightly inferior to what we were doing in the last 12 years. Um, now that we're stepping up maintenance and upgrades, uh, we will probably be ahead of them. But they've done the same thing essentially the Soviet Union did, and that is build mm -hmm. and then don't use the equipment very much so that the wear is light. Mm -hmm. If you look at how much of their Navy goes to sea on any given day, it's around 15%. Mm. Uh, and the Soviet Navy only put 12% at sea. Mm. Most of their ships were uh, basically inactive. Crews went aboard, did most of their training aboard, might go out once every quarter for a couple of days just to maintain crew proficiency. But before they deployed, they did 30 days of workup. And their war planning called for a 45-day mobilization cycle where the ships went out and learned how to fight as a group for 45 days before they dispersed to their combat areas. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. You know, um, I, I remember, I forget what, exactly what year it was, I visited Vladivostok. Of mm -hmm. course, that's the home base of the, uh, the Russian Pacific Fleet. And I just remember seeing all those Serenity destroyers sitting there and sitting there and not moving and not moving. I, so I, I get what you're saying. But um, look, let's get back here to, like, uh, I got you off track a little bit. Sorry, Sorry about that. Uh, I'll take the hit for that one. Um, North Korea, what are we going to do with it? How that's, can we can that, we do anything? Well, that's a tough one, and, and there's two aspects to it that make it tough. One is, first of all, understand the regime's number one priority is regime survival. Mm -hmm. And within the regime, Kim Jong-un's number one uh, priority is staying alive. <laughs> right, uh, right. There's not a very good retirement plan for ex-leaders in dictatorships. Uh, <laughs> they wind up with a small piece of dirt with a bad view. So he's going to fight that in some way or fashion. He's not a wacko. I mean, we're depicting him as unstable is, I think, unwise. Oh, oh, I agree. I don't think anybody in North Korea is a wacko, at least in, in the government, military, um, party setup. They're, they're very clever, actually. Indeed. He does what he can get away with. He tests his ICBMs without going over anyone's territory. He times it so that it generates headlines. And his grandfather and father were very adept at creating these problems, and then the West would leap in to appease them. So their bad behavior was always rewarded. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other advantage that North Korea has is North Korea's relationship with China. China may disapprove of what North Korea is doing, and North Korea is very much a client state. But China doesn't want regime change either, because in their minds, they look at it and say, all bad things happen unless we can control the succession. For example, if that regime goes away tomorrow, what will follow it? Chinese look at it and say, millions of refugees, which we don't want to deal with. And number two, a competition for power as a successor which could go south in a hurry, might bring the Americans north or might bring the conflict spreading over into our territory, neither of which China wants to be involved in. 
And the other thing they look at is if they have to go south to stabilize it, what will we do? It's unpredictable. They don't want to provoke us. And so for them, the status quo, however painful, is better than the alternative. I, I might be saying something controversial here, but I think, the, I think the status quo is preferable to everybody involved. Japan doesn't want a reunited Korea. That's correct. Okay. Um, the United States might like it, depending upon the complexion that it took. We would like it to happen. We are not thinking through what would follow. Right. We never do. China doesn't want it if it means that the United Korea is going to be controlled by Seoul. Um, and like you just said, with, with uh, the, the US, um, uh, U.S. forces Korea on the Yalu River. And I wonder, well, a United Korea, how will that impact um, intra-Asian relations? What, uh, what role would the Koreans play? Let me play? build on your scenario there. I, unfortunately, I've just been told we have only one minute left. I hate okay. to do it to you. This happens all the time. Not to worry. Um, what are the, traditionally, whenever Korea has been united, it has aligned with China. That's why Japan doesn't want a unified oh, Korea. That is a really interesting and, point and of view. That's, and China has a very good relationship with Seoul. And China might help with the unification if it meant getting us off the peninsula, which would just raise all kinds of alarm bells in Japan. So we think of it and say, how would China react to us putting troops on the Yalu River? That's not the way the North Koreans and the Chinese view it. They look at it and say, if it results in a peaceful transition and South Korea takes over, it'll be a pro-Chinese South Korea within a generation. Very interesting, very interesting point of view. I think maybe on that note, maybe we should end here. Uh, I want to thank you for watching Asian Review today. I want to thank our guest for coming along and sharing his insight with us. Uh, be sure to join us next week. My guest will be Gordon Chang, as uh, somewhat of a controversial figure and commentator on uh, uh, U.S.-Asia relations, especially his comments on China. So it should be a great show, and we'll see you then.